Hello and welcome to Coffee Milk. I'm Mark Laporte. And I'm Mitch Vallow. You've been getting shit for the the thing, and you just said that it doesn't matter what you do, everybody's going to get shit when they start out for starting a company. Yeah, yeah. Just anything, just in the internet industry or tech industry in general, anything that you do just looks crazy to the average person and doesn't really make sense. So, like, just this morning, I was scrolling through Twitter, and there's so many people in the same boat as me because you, you'd see people just reaching out and saying, help me get my account to 10K subscribers just so I can show my parents that I know what I'm doing. And it's like, you could just tell everyone around the world is just having these arguments with their parents when, they, when they're trying to get into this space. It's a different time frame. It's not like it used to be where you went out and you got a crazy blue collar job. You can literally do anything mm -hmm. and make money doing it. What, we were talking Monday? And when I was helping out, you out with your site with the Zoic, mm -hmm. and that was the first time because we couldn't log into the admin panel. Actually, you couldn't get to the admin panel oh, because no. you got that error message. Couldn't get to anything. The whole site was down. So we played with that, got a Zoic on it, and now we're getting the Google domain status approved. But at the same time, you also kind of gave me a little bit of guff, or it's been two weeks since we had our crazy idea of air in a jar, and I still haven't done the, the website. I built the website in two and a half hours. Took me two weeks of procrastination for a two and a half hour job. And I, what do you, so what do you think? I think that you did a fantastic job. Really? I give myself a B minus. I didn't get the blues or anything that I wanted, but uh, I thought it still kind of looked nice. What do you mean the blues? Well, when we were discussing this website, we were talking about a blue background or a light blue yeah. the ocean and stuff, but okay. this is white. Yeah. Well, I think it looks good either way. The pictures of the background and the beaches and everything are great. The the menu where you go and buy each different jar of air, you have each different location and a different picture for each location. You have the text right when you come on the website about our mission and how you're going to run through the beaches of Newport and jar up air. Um, I mean, you did a great job. All that was chat GPT. Yeah. Thing. I just literally said, uh, give me a quick snippet about the mansions, the elms, or Marble House, or the breakers. Now, the problem is I haven't been in Newport in a long time, and I definitely haven't been to the mansions in a minute. So I don't know if you can actually go behind them and there's a beach, or if it's just like the rock wall or the cliff walk. So I actually don't know. I actually haven't been there in a while, but all I know is there are plenty of beautiful locations that we can yeah, I that did, we can jar up air from. I did like the jar of air. Okay, so now that... I've been thinking about it more. I really believe we got to get rid of the mason jar. Mason jar is gone. We got to look into yeah. nicer jars. And I'm looking at it with those kind of hinged lids that have a hinge on the front and just like lock it sealed shut. Yes. That like having better packaging in general, just like any other product out there, half of the experience is taking it out of the out of the packaging. Well, just uh, uh, Tiffany's, you know, uh, Tiffany, the jewelry company, every yeah. woman loves that little blue box with that white bow. It doesn't matter that the actual piece of jewelry is $30. They spent 300 and they love that box. Yes. So I'm even thinking of going with kind of a, a box with it, a uh, beautiful jar. I was either going to 3d print uh, a tag with the GPS coordinates, the date you did it. Um, maybe something else, maybe a QR code on the back for the video of you actually jarring up the air. I just yeah. kind of wanted this to be an experiment, uh, experience and just a really premium, weird product. Like yeah. it, the experience is worth it more than the actual product. Cause I just showed you that video of the Wagyu steak and it said ordering a thousand dollar Wagyu steak. Yes. And I can't understand how a Wagyu steak costs a thousand dollars, but then I see him come out in this just briefcase, and it was almost like Pulp Fiction, where they opened it and it was glowing gold, and then they take out a a hot branding iron and they brand the steak. And it was just this whole crazy experience. For hold, hold on, don't eat it yet. Let me brand my logo on it first. Exactly, and it was like. I don't know. Something like that just it, takes it over the top. It's gotta just be the. There's something psychological with opening a product and the way the package looks. There's something about that experience that humans enjoy. Right. I didn't want to just give them a mason jar. It's just like, open up the box and it's a mason jar. Yeah. Okay, great. I got a mason. I always, 
you just got to make it look nice and yeah. maybe do an unboxing video. I don't know. And we need, I think we should, yeah, do the whole awesome packaging, nice tag for the location. And then on the website side, kind of give them a whole virtual experience of what we're doing on a jar to jar basis. So wherever we fill up each jar, we'll have videos of the location, maybe some history about it. Yeah, exactly. And, and stuff like that. So people can open up this jar, scan a code on it, and, and also learn about where they're yeah, smelling about the air. Um, or, yes, exactly. Yeah. I really like that. Yeah. You could do a fold up or a little pamphlet on each place. Or even just call up the places and ask them for their pamphlets and then just put insert that in there and yeah. little things like that. Maybe you can even do kind of a Rhode Island experience, put in maybe little gift cards, or not gift cards, just other promotional materials for different shops or companies in Rhode Island. You could do autocraft for the coffee milk since it's a coffee milk podcast. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we should also put our logo on Breath of Newport, like sponsored by Coffee Milk or something like that. That's a good idea. I don't know. Yeah. So that's where I was going with that. I just figured you have to make something so stupid into just such a great experience where yes. it's like, wow. It's, it's all about the experience. Actually kind of genius because I did tell my buddy, Ryan, who I do want to get on the podcast. Awesome, dude. And I told him about it and he was like, Aaron Ajar. He said, that is the craziest thing I heard, and I actually think it's going to work. But he said, the hardest thing, you, you just got to figure out how to market that. Yes. And I don't think ads are the way to go. Or if you do an ad, it'd kind of be a, a Facebook ad, but it would be a Facebook ad of a video. It would have something stupid, like just a big wide camera angle shot of the beach, and you just maybe screaming and running, oh, oh and then just <laughs> jar in the air or something. I don't know. I, I was going with... I think that's a great idea. Just like a beautiful video of the beach. And then three seconds later, I just come running into the frame. Yes, exactly. Screaming or doing something. I don't know. Yeah. You can see it. That is that is the way yeah. that we are going to get this viral. Exactly. I, I don't think this is an ad. Or, right, this, video. Is, this is a viral product. You have to go viral with it yeah. and show people the beauty in its simplicity Yes, and the genius behind the marketing. It's going to be very difficult. It's going to be difficult. If we sell but one. If, this, if we sell one <laughs> jar, I will be so... Experiment succeeded. Uh, yeah. And the thing is, it has to cover the cost of buying the website, which is about 25 bucks. And it has to cover the cost of the one jar. So, yeah, I figure minimum $30 or, but it's got I think more. We should really do like a limited run of these jars because if it's not limited, then it's not special. Okay. How many were you thinking? If, if we're hoping for one sale, like what would the limited run be? I don't know, 25? Ooh, what yeah. It's right around there. Fifth, like, you no 50? more. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Nothing nothing above 50. I like that. Like, very small numbers, like teens. Yep. Because when people see that, you know? They, it might entice them to buy more. Yeah. Have a little countdown clock or something. I agree. And the price of it as well also plays a factor, too. Well, yeah, that's why the price has to coincide with the experience. Yes. And, I mean, I just can't wait to sell one and tell people what we sold one for. <laughs> They're going to be like, wait, what? Yeah. Oh yeah. And then our genius will be unleashed. I was um I was looking up something the other day and I figured out that Google Maps is having an update and it is going to be insane. What was the video? Because I saw it on Instagram, but for some reason I just I, I just skipped through because Oh man. Oh man, you you your mind is going to be blown. I know. So they are taking Google Maps, adding a new section to it in an immersive view. And it's going to be augmented reality on Google Maps. So they have basically mapped out the entire Earth with their data. Right. And then they, since the recent development with AI and everything, they have found out a way to make an augmented reality map from from all the pictures they've taken. So say say you're, um they're rolling this out in other countries right now, but say you're looking for a coffee shop and you're on a really busy street. You can hold up your phone, and it will virtually lay over 
what it's seeing with all of the coffee shops in the area. And then you can click on them and go walk around the inside of the coffee shop from your phone. So this whole like augmented reality thing is going to be insane. Virtual reality will yes. definitely, it's, it's amazing. Augmented but I, I think augmented reality yes. is where it's supposed to go. It is. It's combining virtual reality with, with augmented reality. Whatever you're going around, that's... It's like it's like in the movie where you have that display pop up in front of your eyes. Yes. And you can just, you can just click what you want. And, and, and it's like you have... You have a computer screen floating in the air in front of you, like a hologram. Don't know. It's going to be like glasses that. or something. Yes, it's going to be glasses. It it kind of just blew my mind because it, it really made me understand how or where things are going. Yep. Sometimes when you say that these things, from... my brain has to process that yes. and figure out what I want to say. Yeah. Because I, I've been telling Jay it, it's wild how when I'm talking to you right now, there's literally nothing going on, but... In the augmented reality world, there, there's, you know, a crazy dragon there, or there's a, a treasure chest right there. Yeah. And just all these weird things around you that you yes. just don't see. Either. And what really blew my mind and just kind of opened up my eyes is how all of these companies are working on putting these sensors in their devices that basically map the environment around the device. So say you have a phone and you've been living in the same house long enough for it to map it out. It's going to generate and upload a map of your house to whatever company is trying to download that map. I definitely wouldn't like that. And well, how else would they get the insides of coffee shops in augmented reality? Well, you can go inside certain buildings on Google Maps now. Yes, I believe that's because some guy from Google literally went in there and walked around. I, I think, think they took it from somebody's phone. I think they are collecting data from everyone's phone, from LiDAR sensors, and they are they are mapping out everything they can that that phone sees because if you think about 20 years ahead of time, we are, well, we already do. We have the internet. It's like a world parallel to ours. And that world is just always growing. So pretty soon, that world is going to be parallel to ours in, in basically the same thing. But yeah, it also like merged into one. Yes, merged. Yes. And I think that's how they're going to do it because it all requires data collection. And how else would you collect all of that data other than using all the devices that are already out there. Well, not just say it kind of freaks me out. I mean, I liked it at first when I could see a coffee shop, but if it's mapping out my house, what if I got secret rooms and stuff? I don't want people knowing about my secret rooms. Well, I don't. I always want to build a secret room. I've always wanted to build a little secret room, too. You see them all over TikTok now. It's like people will hang up a painting and then just cut out the wall and make a room behind it, and they'll go viral on TikTok in, in a week. One guy building the room. sent his uh, mother and sister out on a trip and one week's time he wanted to build a secret room under the stairs that nobody would know about and it was it was really wild he cut out the a cut section of the stairs you lift it up you go in there he put a tv and a fridge and everything soundproof the whole thing yeah his mom came home never knew he had also cut a hole in the wall so he had to get a tv in through that way it was genius but I was always thinking like a little bookshelf I was like the bookshelf idea and then you can just kind of either slide the bookshelf out of the way or or put it on hinges or something, but yeah, secret rooms. I don't know. Then I want an underground room or a bunker. Oh, bunker would be sick. You know, crazy things I think of. Have you seen um Colin Furs's bunker that he's been building for years now? Colin, no. Colin Furs. He's basically this DIY um YouTuber who <laughs> just makes all sorts of crazy tech. He's made a he's made a hovering motorbike. Um, he's made he's made jet go karts. He's made. He has made everything that you can think of. He's made a guitar that shoots flames out the end of it. it it's insane. <laughs> but he has been tunneling. Well, he started He started with making one bunker in his backyard, and then he connected it to his house, and then he connected it to his, his garage outside. So this guy is basically just tunneling under his house and... In, in, and um, putting documenting the whole thing on YouTube, it's 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 amazing. What's his name? Chris Ferguson. Colin Fer. Colin Fergus. Colin. You've heard of him for sure or seen him. Yeah. Oh, Colin Ferguson. Okay. It is tunnel from house to shed. And he's been doing this for five years. Oh, it's it's amazing because you really, you just see these people doing incredible things, and then when they connect it to the internet and they get a community behind it, they they have what the. 
incredible amounts of just like um funding and 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 support that they can just continue their projects with dude this is beautiful this is beautiful this underground bunker this guy is like he is a tinkerer of all things oh my word and he does everything so nice so clean so he's got flamethrowers and all kinds of crazy all of his finished designs are Beautiful. Colin Furs, F-U-R-Z-E? Yes. Highly recommend him, but I'm sure everybody on the other end of this, uh, on the street. Yeah, they've definitely heard of him. Well, well maybe not, but... 12 million views? Yeah, apparently I'm really far behind. <laughs> wow. Yeah, he's amazing. I don't... The problem is I don't think... Well, we have a septic out there, so... And I don't think with the water table we could do such a thing. I don't know. Not Probably not. Not in not. Not. of somebody... Old, because Rhode Island. Wait, did you say Oak Island? Old Rhode Island. Oh, but you're saying Oak Island. No. Have well, you ever seen that show? It is oak trees filled with oak trees, right? What is Oak Island? No, I've never seen it. Oh, it's a place in Nova Scotia, and apparently there was a treasure there, and it was in 1780s or 60s or something. Okay. A bunch of kids were in a, a boat. They were going down some bay or something, and they yeah. see lights on this island. And they go to check out the lights, and yeah. there's no lights there, but they see a crazy depression in the in the dirt. So they take out, they come back maybe a couple days later and take out shovels and they dig down. I want to say it was ten feet down. They found a, a stone, almost like Viking symbols on it, and then below that they found coconut fibers and logs, and then they kind of realized, okay, this is a treasure shaft, and they kept digging down. There's no coke coconut fibers in Nova Scotia, those are all tropical. I mean, coconuts are very tropical, so yeah. coconut fibers get there. Yeah. So that's how they thought there was a treasure, and it's been going on for the pl the past 200 years. Presidents have gotten involved in this uh, expedition, a lot of people. Now it's just two brothers and their team, and they've been documenting it for nine, ten years, and everybody makes fun of me for watching it. My cousin every week makes fun of me. He's like, oh, Watch out, Oak Island, they're going to find more wood because that's all they really find on the... They found, like, coins and old stuff, but they still haven't found the treasure, but they know it's there. Wow. All these sensors they put in these holes that they drill, it says, yes, there's gold here. A good, high amounts of gold are coming up. And so they made a TV show based on a an island that... Oh, yeah, it's a very documentary. It's... Uh, I still got the last two episodes to watch. I haven't, I haven't seen the new stuff. That. That's pretty cool. It Did is. they find the? Was it a deposit of gold under the coconut? Did they dig further? That's the thing because it wasn't there. No, they kept doing it, but they could only dig down so far. There, it's the 1700s. Troubles. Yeah. So in the 1800s, um, new guys bought the island and everything, and they just practically destroyed a lot of it, especially in the 1900s. One guy just took out large amounts of dirt and he disturbed a whole bunch of the area so that now these the guys who are doing it today, they don't quite know where the money pit was and that's what they call it, the original hole was yes. the money pit. Yes. Um, they don't know where it was because everything was now backfilled and covered up and there oh. were other shafts uh, from other treasure hunters because when they dug down maybe 60 feet, they disrupted a booby trap in the whole tunnel filled with water. And they now they just can't figure out how to get it. Oh no! Oh yeah, but now that we have all this technology today, they're putting crazy pipes in there and trying to that suck out all the water. It fascinates wild. me. Oh, it's amazing because the technology they had back in the day to make that sh to make that. How do they? And they don't know when it, what it dates back to. That's the crazy part because they're finding coins. It's going back maybe to 1100 AD. Then they're finding things that kind of coincide with the Knights Templar, and they don't know if they suspect that maybe at the bottom of the thing is the Ark of the Covenant, where the Ten Commandments are, because the Knights Templar took it all away. And wild story is so incredible. I just hope that one day, this is such a blanket statement, <laughs> but I just hope that one day we just figure everything out Never. and we can go to one place. And we can actually read about how we got here today in a in an organized manner. Yeah, nice nice perfect timeline. Yeah. I don't think it's gonna happen. 
because I think there's too many questions. And we have so much information manipulation. And there was this cool story of this guy. And I don't know why we're going off on this, but I find this interesting. It is. <laughs> and now that we're just going, we're just going to go with it. There was a guy in Turkey who was remodeling his house. He tears down a wall and there was a, a cave right behind the wall. In the cave, it's like a movie, goes down maybe three, four, five stories. There's rooms everywhere. Oh. They believe it housed maybe 100,000 people because it is beautiful. Oh. The guy had this entire cave system right behind a wall in Turkey. Uh, you got you to gotta look at the pictures. All you have to yeah, do. It's like that just fascinates me. I hope that one day I can like travel the world and just go see all of these incredible sites that people discover because finding something like that groundbreaking turns your life into a into a movie oh plus i think they dated it back to twelve thousand years ago wow and that's pretty like imagine just digging in your backyard and being like oh found a tunnel one guy found uh it was a farmer he he saw a stone rise up in his field and he kind of dug around it and he realized it was this crazy monumental kind of like stonehenge structure oh and then he dug a little bit more and then he called an archaeologist and they think it's a couple of miles of a city it's called gobekli tepe whoa yeah and yeah it's beautiful See? and they can't they don't know how far back that comes at least ten thousand like years when we grew up we were always told that all of these lost cities and all of this um uh, what we're talking about now doesn't exist and then surprise surprise <laughs> We found another oh, buried city somewhere else, and, you know, it's nuts. The Mayan cities in South America, I don't know if they're all Mayan, so forgive me on that one, but the crazy ancient cities in my uh, South America that people go to, like, uh, I'm never going to get it, but it's that period pyramid in Mexico my parents went to, and one kid, I want to say was a teenager, realized that all cities are kind of based on constellations and, and star maps and stuff. So what he did was he took the main cities known that were the ancient cities in Mexico, and he took a star map and he put it right on top, and there were certain stars that corresponded to those cities. Then he said, okay, if those stars correspond to these cities, all these other stars that are hitting areas in the jungle must mean that there are cities there. So a 13-year-old kid using a star map literally found ancient cities that haven't been discovered yet. Wow. Just through a star map. That, I mean, that's just way to think outside the box. The way people got around it was by looking up at the sky. I, I mean, mean we were taught that in history class, how they, on ships, they used um, these wooden, like, like little wooden mechanical structures to read the stars and like the angles between them to right. where they were. Right. I don't know exactly what they're called. Neither do I. I just want I know to know thing. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how the, those people can look at stars and find their way home. Incredible. It should be something that's taught everywhere. What if we look at a star map here and we find a buried city? It's possible. Not maybe a buried city, but you could probably find like an ancient city. You know, there probably is a lot of history in Rhode Island and just New England in general because people were always near the water. Yeah, and this is... Because that's where things... The original colonies, too. The trading, like... Everything went back and forth from the water. Well, if you go up in New Hampshire, you're going to see some crazy stone structures. And a lot of people are saying, oh, well, it's just a, a root cellar, old root cellars. But no, when the colonists came here and they saw these structures, they wrote about them and they predate the colonists. Um, and there's a, like a Viking slab with a slot all around it. And it's kind of like a human sacrifice thing or a sacrifice thing. So it looks like it's almost a, a collection table or blood or water Ooh. or something. Yeah. And so, yeah. I mean, we know the Vikings have come here before Columbus, but it's who came here before the Vikings. Incredible. Okay, well, that was a nice little history side tangent there. I was listening to my first million. They were saying how when you do a podcast, 
sometimes you just get so into conversation that you will say things that you didn't don't even realize and then you have to just you have to cut them out that's why sometimes i i like going with our semi-structured format we have now yeah but it, sometimes it's just it, it's not like we're having a conversation it's just like you're reading off facts it so, doesn't sound natural some days i am a robot that's exactly how it sounds some days i am a robot you just kind of i blank out yeah well, i i will like it's like i'm um, it's so intensely processing in my brain that i just it's just it just wipes everything out that's like in front of my eyes and i just like <laughs> yeah, I get that blank stare too. Yeah. Plus, I think sometimes we do it too early. One thing I always thought about was uh, there's this app called Duolingo, and yeah. another one it teaches you, it kind of like gamifies learning uh, a language. Yes. I was thinking of doing the same thing for just normal things that kids should have learned in high school or things that they should teach in high school because a lot of kids come out. They get their first job. They got to fill out the 401k information, stuff for insurance, their taxes. Nobody knows how to do that stuff. Kids end up calling their parents and hopefully getting a good answer. But sometimes even the parents don't know because they've only had two or three jobs in their life. And where they're at now, they've been there for 30 not years. They everyone, don't know. Not everyone necessarily wants to go and Google that information. Well, plus you're not really going to get exactly what you need. And, yeah. and the instructions on the W-2... I think it's W-2 or W-9, I can't remember. But it, it's not so self-explanatory. It, it tells you add up all these numbers, and then whatever the final number is, that's what you put at the bottom, and that's what you claim when you get a job. But you can also claim, because sometimes it'll end up as zero, and it's like you claim zero, it's almost the most that they'll take out of your paycheck. But I didn't realize you could do double zero. My aunt taught me that. So when I'm, I'm at work, I claim double zero. I did Apparently, not know that either. They take out the most amount of taxes, so you kind of get a bigger refund or you cover at least everything you owe. If you could kind of create some sort of app that rewards you or, or just kind of like gamifies learning that information in just micro sections, I think that would benefit adults or young adults or just kids coming out of high school. I think it would because doing anything like you just said in micro sections and number two, just gamifying it as well helps tremendously because everyone today wants information in little spurts in bits that's just what we're trained for yes not many people realize it but once you start doing it that way you realize how it works it, i think it's easier to retain the information because people can go off for an hour you know i had a physics yeah. class in college and i could get the beginning and then after a while he would just keep talking and i'd be lost because there's just so much information thrown at you in in an hour or two but if you could have broken it down to five-minute sections, ten-minute sections, it's like, okay, just focus on that. Do you grasp this? Okay, next. I wish that we went about education in a different way. And so, we didn't, I don't know, that's a lot to talk about. Yeah, that's why we have a podcast, because we need something to talk about a lot of. So, I wish we kind of went about education in a way that you are just basically, so say you're going to, you're, you're taking a class on financial accounting. I wish that you walk in the class day one, everyone is given, say an income statement or a balance sheet, something, some end goal that they have to get to with no knowledge. And they are just like, do it now, however you can do it. And then have the teacher kind of like walk around and give students help and give them like maybe yeah get, give them information along with the task they have to complete but just throw them right into it don't give them a uh, hour lecture where you just stand there and talk like, no one wants to hear that especially in accounting we want we need people actively working and doing things with their mind not just sitting there trying not to drool and then I think that would be like, that That would, I don't know. Well, half the time when I was in a lecture, I was just kind of drawing in my notebook. I'd always draw spirals. I don't know why I'm obsessed with spirals, but okay. yeah, that's what I would do. It, unless it was really, and accounting was one of those classes, oddly, that I actually just kind of zoned in on. The other one was macro and microeconomics, who were taught by a Russian teacher. 
I had a thick Russian accent, but, and I always skewed the bell curve. I, like I messed it up for everybody because people would constantly get C's, D's, or F's in there. And I get an A because I just, I, I could grasp it. It was fun for me. I like that stuff. Yeah. That's why I went in for investment banking. I, I really like the uh, micro and macroeconomics too. Yeah, you were telling me you liked the other course. Um, you, you texted me, you're like, this stuff's awesome. I think it was accounting. Was it accounting? Yeah, accounting was accounting was pretty cool because, and and that's why I'm I said earlier about how we need to get students just thrown into things right away, and then make them connect the dots later. Um, because when I did my homework, I didn't read any of the textbook or anything, and then I just start doing the homework, and it's just like it's so much easier for me and i feel like it just gets engraved into my brain when i constantly make mistakes and then fix them and then at the end of it when you have the homework complete it's like you just realized how much you just like learned by throwing yourself into the fire first and then doing it yes this is why i tell you no analysis paralysis because sure aaron ajar is absolutely stupid but if you can get your site to rank number one on google and say you could actually write beautiful copy where people actually sell a jar Fantastic. And if they don't, then you've just learned what maybe not to do, or you've learned what works, but the product's so stupid that you just didn't sell anything. Like, yeah. You know, you learn by failing. You don't learn by succeeding. That's probably the worst thing that could happen to you. I know. It's just, it's so, it's so wrong. It's like we just, it's as if you go to a casino for the first time. When you turn 21, we're going to go to Foxwoods or whatnot. The worst thing that could absolutely happen is you win big. That's the worst thing that could happen. People say, no, the worst thing, you lose money. But no, losing money teaches you the value of the money that you just lost and how sick you are about gambling. But if you <laughs> gamble the first time and you win big, you think you're going to do that all the time. And that's what happened to me with the stock market. First time I played with the stock market, it's like, I won big. It was over 100% return in less than seven hours. And then the Forex, I traded on the Forex. So that's foreign exchange. I'd trade like dollars for a Japanese yen. I would just win. I mean, it was easy at that time because Shinzo Abe said, no, no, the price target for the, the yen or the won, I, I never knew how to pronounce that, would be 119 won per $1. And at the time it was at 99. It's like, okay, well, this is a great way to make a lot of money. So that was easy, but that's... You learn by failing. You learn how not to do things, and I think that's the best way to do it. Now, for schools, you just got to get out of the, the model of putting people in the classroom, putting them at a desk, doing the lecture. There's got to be a better way, and I, I just don't know what that is yet. I mean, maybe it is an app because a lot of things are going towards online, remote learning. So there are things like Khan Academy. It was this uh, great thing. Wow, God, I couldn't even tell you how long ago. Maybe 15 years ago. Khan Academy was a unicorn startup, right? Basically. Khan Academy was just one guy who was trying to teach his niece math. Oh, so wow. he, he did it in YouTube videos, but he shared the YouTube videos with everybody, and a lot of people loved his style of teaching that they learned so much from that Bill Gates essentially, I believe, gave him money to to build this up into what it's become because I used it when it was just algebra and, and other functions. I was like, wow, this is really nice because at 25, you know, you just kind of want to reteach yourself math, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> or just relearn from a different perspective. And, and he was a great teacher. I mean, you got it the first shot. But yeah, it was just something stupid that he was doing for his niece that turned into what it was. And Bill Gates essentially just yeah he bankrolled them so that brings me to the app that uh i saw a couple days ago called realworld.co and you can get on the apple store and stuff but it kind of it's not really gamified but they do have just learn regular stuff how to self-clean the oven or how to clean the oven how to do personal finance, uh, set up a budget, things like that, or even as simple as it seems like pack a suitcase for a trip. I thought it was pretty cool. It seems like it's it just goes over the basics of that stuff and doesn't really go into depth, but it it's a free, free software, and I think it's worthwhile to check it out and see if you can learn personal finance or anything like that if you're having any questions. Realworld.co. Cool. Well, like I said earlier, with my accounting homework, instead of reading about it i just kind of jumped in and then started doing it 
And that's how I've learned a lot of things throughout my life. Um, just kind of diving in. Yeah, just diving in. And when I watched Randy Pausch's lecture, it kind of just became so apparent to me that that's a very good way to learn things. So you really, you saw the whole thing? Yes. Was was that great? He brought up the head fakes and everything, and I loved how at the end he's like, did you figure out the head fake from this whole last lecture? He said, it's not for you, it's for my kids. Yeah. And that just kind of broke my heart. But, I'll, yeah, I mean, if you guys haven't heard of Randy Pausch, it's an amazing and sad story of this professor from Carnegie Mellon. And at Carnegie Mellon, uh, I don't know if it's once a quarter or maybe once a year, they have something called The Last Lecture. What would be the last lecture you would try to explain to people before you died? Or what's something you'd want to tell to people before you died, your last lecture? So this professor, Randy Pausch, he got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, stage four, given maybe three months left to live. And he gets approved to give his last lecture at Carnegie Mellon. But at that point, they had completely changed the name to something else, like Reflections or something. So he kind of starts off with that little joke. He said, you know, I got this thing. It's the last lecture. I'm all excited. I I'm going to die in three months. And if you guys don't think I'm as depressed or morose I'm so I should be, then I'm sorry to disappoint you. But, you know, now they changed the name on me, and I nailed the venue, and they change it on me. And it it's just, it was great because he was all lighthearted about this whole thing. And he had recently got married, and he had a couple of kids and one on the way, and they're all very young, and he's in his late 40s. And it was just, uh, I mean, to me, I, I don't know how I'd handle such news, but his whole last lecture was achieving your childhood dream. And he had many, uh, like Bill Gates and stuff. His mind was just scattered and he was obsessed with Star Trek and football and a whole bunch of different things, as you do as a kid. But as an adult, there was so much that he didn't get to accomplish so he gets this diagnosis, talks about it, and then, I mean, good things kind of started happening from it. Star Trek was coming out with their brand new movie. I haven't done a movie in maybe 10 years or 20 years, and they offer Randy Pausch a part on the movie. And then I think it was the Pittsburgh Steelers, they offered him to come down and hang out and, and play in a scrimmage, just all these little things. And then he tells you how if... You're ever doing something, and then you just kind of hit a brick wall. You can't act as if the walls are meant to keep you out. They're meant for you to kind of just go over. You, you gotta, you're gotta, you going to achieve hurdles in your life that you got to figure out how to climb over. And that was the thing. If you hit a brick wall, just climb over it. You're going to hit another one. Brick walls aren't designed to keep you out. They're designed to keep other people out. And it's just how people are... At the time, they wanted gratification now. They didn't yeah. want to wait for it. It's even worse today. Exactly. And it's like 60 seconds. That he made that observation back then. In 2008. Because he saw it, and it just only got worse. I mean, now we're down to probably 15-second attention spans. Once I saw that video, that video kind of changed my life because there's a guy with a terminal illness. He... Had, was given three months to live, but he ended up living for, I think, another 15 months. And I would email him and tell him how inspiring this thing was and mm -hmm. how it kind of just m made me realize, no, you, you can't read about things, you can't learn about things, you have to do things, you have to be actionable in your own life. You want to make sure that when you're 40, 50, 60, that you look back at your childhood self and think would the child in me be proud of where i am today did i accomplish the stuff i wanted to as a kid because that's who you should be actually doing everything for is is your younger self who had all these dreams because i feel once you hit a certain age life beats you down you don't think anything's possible anymore you think it's just a nine to five grind there's no way to make money everything's rigged against you or you could have the mindset it's like in a good life, you have 80 years on this planet. You have 80 summers, 80 winters, 80 falls. Now, when you put it like that, that's not a lot. You've already gone through 19 of them. I've gone through 40, okay? So half my life is gone. I got 40 left. 
So it shouldn't matter what you think about what others think of you. Try and make your younger self happy. That's all you should be rooting for. You don't. It doesn't matter. Everybody's going to have a great idea that turns into something that somebody once shitted on and said, you're an idiot for thinking that way. It's like, okay, well, if we don't think that way, then there is no progress in oh, this world. Wait, I think it was Shat. Shack? Shat on. Oh. Yeah, now you just shat on my train of thought. <laughs> so now I have to figure out where I was going with that. So I have 40 years left, or 40 seasons left. Do you think I care what people think of me? No, I'm just going to do what I want to do. As long as you're happy, I don't care why people... I don't understand why people always... When you meet them now, it's like, oh, what do you do? As if what you do is who you are, and that's not the case. I mean, I build cars. I'm not a car builder you know i'm mark i i'm trying to build a podcast i'm trying to help out a friend figure out what he wants to do with his life i'm trying to i don't know, do a whole bunch of stuff i just want to make myself happy and that's all you should be thinking about too and that youtube video or his last lecture inspired me so much and it just gave me a different perspective and it was just like okay just try and go for Everything you possibly can, whatever your dream is. At that time, online poker was huge, and I was really big in online poker. I played Ultimate Bad Poker Stars, just everything. And what I really liked about it was the fast-paced games. But they were never fast enough because some people would just, I don't know, sit out, and they would just wait for their timer to go down. It'd be a minute. It'd drive me nuts. So I'd four-table it. I'd at least have four tables going at any one time. Nuts. On Ultimate Bet, they had a, a thing at the bottom. It was a promotion. They wanted it was Phil Helmuth and Annie Duke, and they had a bet against each other that they could take normal players and turn them into pros. And they wanted to see they had oh, a ten thousand or a twenty thousand dollar bet on who could take ordinary people and make them big. But you had to apply for this, and they wanted you to create a video. Now, at the time, I had worked third shift at this hotel down in Bristol. I, I had I saw that, and that was right after the Randy Pouch thing, and I don't know, it, something just happened to me where I knew I was getting on this thing. Like, I had this overwhelming feeling that I have never had again that, okay, this is it. This You're seeing this now because you are meant to go on this show. So I called up my buddy who was really good at filming things, and at 3 in the morning, he would come down to the hotel, and we'd film, like, little pieces for a, a two-minute video that I could apply to be on this show. It was, I think it was in October that we started filming, and I had gotten it up in sometime late November. Now, they were filming on December 7th, and I had told my boss, maybe that night that I saw the advertisement or the next day, look, I need this week off. I'm going to Vegas. And he's like, what? I said, yeah, I applied for this show. I'm going to get on. I need this week off. It wasn't until they were filming on Monday. It wasn't until Friday afternoon. I remember I was about to fall asleep on the couch because I had to go to work that night. And then the answering machine picks up and it's like, yes, hi, it's so-and-so from this production company. We had just looked over your video. We like it. We know it's short notice. Can you come on uh, can you fly out on monday i'm like no problem yeah i already bought i uh i took the week off and everything so they got me the tickets they got me the hotel and everything getting there was a pain in the wow. ass but it was just this feeling and we had worked on that video for maybe three weeks and before i had go to had to go to work i'd go yeah. to his house and we'd edit the whole film and i'd tell him where i'd want certain things and that's what actually got me into editing video was that whole experience yeah Wow, but that is crazy. It, it was just an overwhelming feeling. And also at the time, I had just gotten done watching The Secret, that documentary I showed you. And yeah. How it was just all about manifesting. And when you have good feelings, think about what you want and, you know, just manifest it. And I'm not that guy. I'm not the person who's like, oh, yeah, manifestation. I didn't believe in that stuff. Yeah. But it was this feeling that I had. Every time a song would come on, it would... There were certain songs around that time that would just pump me up and I would think about, okay, I, I would think the exact moment I got that phone call and who I was going to call next and telling, and it was my mom, and telling my mom, look, they called me, I got on the show. Like I had this whole visualization in my brain and I, I just wish 
I knew how to get that back because that feeling was so overwhelming. It was like I knew at that moment I was on the right path. And yeah, it was a really cool experience. I got to meet Sully Erna from Godsmack and sorry. And then I met this guy um, who played on Seinfeld and Jennifer Tilly and got to meet all these crazy people. It was, a, wow. it was an awesome time. And I still keep in touch with some of them today, but it, it's just amazing. You never know. And it probably, if it wasn't for his last lecture, I wouldn't have had the, the chutzpah or whatnot to actually try out for something like that. Yeah. Things could have been completely different. So how'd you do in, it was a poker tournament? Oh yeah. Um, was interesting. What you realized at the end is reality TV is completely fake. And instead of real people, they took the, the, the famous people like Sully Erna from Godsmack. Of course he got picked. And the singer for Ansmack, uh, Anthrax, Scott Ian, he got picked. And it was just all the famous people. So it was kind of like, well, I mean, it didn't really work out because it was a mix of real people and then famous people. And they pick all the famous people. Oh, no. Or the actual pros who go to the World Series of Poker every year. And I don't know. But... It, it was still a great experience. I totally would do it again because after the first day, and I was I played amazing. If you watch my whole thing, and uh, later on I'll play it for you, uh, I was awesome. Like I had the great hands when they were filming us, and it just couldn't have gone any better. But then the next day, no, I was cut. And then they actually felt bad, so they had bought out a club, and we had all, it was like 20 people, and we're all just hanging in an empty club everything's going booze is free and then we went out and we played a little poker tournament the winner would get a seat at the world series of poker and main event and then the other people just kind of got cash prizes and then they left you with like a couple they gave you a couple of grand for your troubles and everything paid for everything and they were just awesome people phil helmuth is a genuinely nice guy wow i mean he's kind of crazy on tv and he seems like he's all over the place but that guy's got a good heart because yeah. he, uh, during the poker tournament, he had bought Dom Perignon, which is just like expensive champagne. I think it's personally overrated. It's just the name. But the guy, I remember the guy bringing it out and then he takes out this big, thick stack of hundreds and he gave the, the guy who brought it out a thousand dollars and he was just really nice to everybody, signing autographs. It was, it was one of the greatest times. Wow, must have been awesome. So that was my little story and rant about Randy Pausch and how it changed my life. Now I don't know what to segue in from that because that's actually a really, uh, that was kind of good. So the interest, interesting person that I found for this episode was Palmer Lucky, and he was the founder of Oculus Rift, the company that makes the VR headsets. Isn't it like a teenager? Yes, and 19. Insane. Yeah, and you're not, the company. And you're 19, we're selling air. No, we're not selling here yet. <laughs> we're trying, but <clears throat> okay. So he started out as just like a normal high school kid. He grew up with a passion for technology and he had a great interest in virtual reality. He always would be the kid to kind of just tinker around in in his garage or whatever. He would make rail guns. He would make Tesla coils. He would make all types of high voltage projects he got shocked multiple times one time he um shocked himself so bad i think he got blew across the garage anyways he comes across vr headsets and he notices that they're really cool as they are at the time but he started taking them apart and learning how they work and he saw that the technology inside them was the right technology but it just wasn't the highest quality okay and there were other few things that he had to work out like the the motion tracking with the hands and also the um peripheral vision of the vr experience so if you have a better um peripheral vision in the headset then you're more immersed in the game and it feels more real so he worked on all of those things and the reason why i connect this to randy pausch is he did all of the VR headset work just to make the experience better for himself. It's amazing how little projects like that turn into big things yes. if you're doing it for yourself. And I believe it's the internet community that was also kind of be behind it as well and kind of helping him improve and pushing him along kind of made this whole thing happen. 
Wait, didn't he have? He had a Kickstarter because I actually yeah. remember that, but it was kind of expensive. I think it was like fifteen hundred dollars at the time. Yes, the and only so many people got headsets. Right. There was no way I was buying that. And an issue they had was a lot of people were getting VR sickness from the headsets too in the beginning phases, and that was like like you said a brick wall. It's like they had no clue how to solve it, and then someone I believe reached out to him and helped him solve the issue. Someone reached out to him and helped him solve the issue of the VR sickness, and then it, so many people, so so many more people were able to experience it without getting sick, and it was just that really helped grow it as well. Because that's one thing my father's always been afraid of. He uh, he can't ever play a video game or anything. He kind of gets motion sickness just watching video games or playing. And he was always afraid of virtual reality because I remember, I think Samsung had one for one of their phones. So I remember my cousin had bought the set and I had tried it and it was it was pretty cool what they had. All I, I did was, I think, a skydiving one. And then there was a, another app at the time. This might have been five, ten years ago. It, it was just like a log cabin and it had a big screen and you could watch your Netflix through VR and it was like you were in a log cabin. Yeah, it that's was, pretty cool. It was really wild. I thought it was very yeah. unique, but I wanted my dad to see it and he's like, oh, I can't do that. I'll get sick. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually, my mom tried it, a driving simulator with the uh, oh. the VR headset and she immediately got had sick and had to take it off. Yeah. Yeah, I think driving would be a little much for people. Yeah. So in 2014, Facebook acquired Oculus VR for $2 billion. Two Making million? Lucky a multimillionaire at the age of 21. Was it not $2 billion? No, I didn't know. I was asking. Yeah. So, made him a multimillionaire at the age of 21. Um, he worked on the Quest for about two years with them. And then he was kind of kicked out of Facebook in a really controversial way, which I didn't really expect to happen. So He supposedly donated to an anti- Hillary Clinton um oh it got political yes fund and Facebook just said we can't have this representing our company and then fired him and then he sued Facebook because they fired him based on political standing which is illegal, illegal and he got 100 million for it get out of town good yes. to him it was probably because there's always that option when you buy a company, you kind of like acquire all the people in it, and sometimes they hire CEOs. Yeah. stuff. And also, the views of Oculus that Lucky had and the views of virtual reality that Facebook had didn't really align either because Lucky was more about the gaming experience and the user experience. And then Oculus wanted, I mean, Facebook wanted to change everything about Oculus to get more data collection. Oh, that makes sense. In user collection, because Facebook, the whole reason why they acquired Oculus was because they did not want to miss out on the next big internet trend. Oh, yeah. He was adamant on not missing out. Because at the time, Sony was trying to do it. Everybody's in VR. They're trying yeah. to get theirs to work. And he had a fully functioning prototype, and it was actually one of the best on the market, like you couldn't beat it, where if he went alone, sure, he had the best product, but he didn't have the distribution, he didn't have the marketing, he couldn't have pushed it along as far and as fast as if Facebook acquired them, they could put billions into it immediately, yeah. and they could beat out all the competition. So if he probably didn't take that, then Sony or somebody else would have beaten him, and he would have the best product, but it's still first to market wins. Yeah. After that, he said that he, he 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 didn't take that in any negative way shape or form he just moved on and he went right into his next unicorn startup um andrew industries so after leaving facebook with massive amounts of cash he looked for a new industry he noticed that the defense industry was filled with projects that just took forever to build and got nowhere just because of the way that government programs were naturally set up where you are incentivized to overspend and take as much time as you can to develop whatever technology you are developing for the military. So he entered this field with a the, with the mission to create fully functional products and then sell them to the military. So he entered the field with a different view than everyone else in the field had. He said, I am going to make things that already work, are fully functional, 
and then bring them to the military and sell them to them. He's working on underwater autonomous vehicles. Okay. He's working on drones, like basically drone fleets. He's saying that in the future, a war isn't really going to be man to man. It's going to be machine to machine. It's going to be yep. machine to machine, yep. and it's going to be more about attacking specific like infrastructure yep. and maybe using a lot of like new technology to fight like putting down networks sending drones over and doing surveillance with drones and also having ai track things in the sky their path they're moving at and shoot them down predict where they're gonna go with algorithms yeah so his company is revolutionizing and bringing ai to war machines wars. i think i heard an interview with him once before sounds like an awesome guy but it's just are we building skynet are we are we creating terminators pretty soon i think we already have created terminators i think they exist it's just i mean google has a robot that works on natural language processing and goes up to trash cans looks in the trash can decides if anything shouldn't be in the trash can like recycling takes it out puts it in the recycling bin why it's not like it gets recycled because, you know how, because they're learning how to train robots. Do you know how much of all the recycling that you send out actually gets recycled? Do you know the total oh, I know. stuff that actually gets recycled? I've, I've looked it up before. It's it's like very low. It's 3%. Yep. 3% of your total recyclables are actually recycled. The rest just goes to the landfill. Yeah. No. Scary. It's, I don't It just lets you know where the problem lies. Yeah. We don't have proper ways of recycling. Like no. I, I just, I don't get. We don't. It. Plus, I'm told if there's any food left in a jar or something, yeah, you gotta. Yeah, you get rid of the out. whole world. Uh, and some load. people don't know that, and they just throw stuff out dirty, and then that's why. Those are just lazy people. Yeah, but so the thing about Palmer Lucky is what he said that made him successful. Listening to what his uh, grandfather taught him when he was younger, his grandpa told him that many people today make money and then try to get that money to work for them but that's not the true way to make money and live your life the true way to do it is to invest in yourself and invest in in your knowledge and then build and create things and have people invest in you because you've done so well and other people want you to improve and that's how you really grow. Because sure, you can invest. I mean, yes, he, he's not saying don't invest your money wisely, but invest more in yourself. And yeah, this is why I, I like the whole gamification of life. If you can gamify your life, like level yourself up. And by that, it's take another course. You want to learn marketing, take a marketing course or anything like that. It's just level yourself up, get new skills, use those skills, build something and have people give you money. Because, sure, you could get 7% a year, and after seven years or so, it doubles. Yeah. But you're going to get a lot more money in seven years if you invest in yourself, create something, and have people invest in you. Yeah. That, that's a really good piece of advice. I got a good piece of advice for you. This is just more life advice. When you get a girlfriend or a wife or whatnot, you're always going to have, because we just ordered lunch a little while ago, and trying to figure out where to get lunch was just a hassle. So I've learned the trick. If you have a girlfriend or a wife and you're trying to decide where to go out to eat. They it's in. No, that's my cousin. Oh. When they're trying to determine where to go to eat, if you're the husband, just tell the wife, guess where I'm taking you right now. Whatever her first response is, that's the answer. Instead of being like, what do you want to eat? I don't know, Chinese? No, I don't want Chinese. I want, well, I don't really want that. It's just one of those bullshit things. Breaking news. Nagatuck police arrest two men connected to illegal wheel, weed van on wheels. It's a dispensary. A mobile dispensary. They're selling marijuana and CD, CBD products. You get to see this van. It's completely all green, has weed, some weed leaves all over it. It's called Rollaholic Mobile Dispensary. They were parking in the Walmart parking lot <laughs> and selling weed out of the van. I don't understand. Uh, I'm going to, no. we're going to create a new segment now. Every week, we're going to create a dumbass of the week segment because this guy got arrested. Apparently, 
this is going to be okay in Connecticut because I think they, they saw this and were like, wow, this is a pretty good idea. We're going to create permits and everything for this. But this guy had no permits, no license to sell anything. He just parks in a Walmart parking lot with a big van that says, look at me. I sell weed. I just, I, wow. it's a beautiful van and I love the marketing, but you have to be a complete moron to be doing this. And I only think it's well, been legal there for like the last month. I don't know. There might be a lesson in this one. He, he said, screw it. I'm going to go sell weed in my van without permits. And now they're making the permits because of him. Yes, but he's now the poster child for being a <laughs> dumbass. He is, but... While also yeah, creating an trailer. Industry. Yes, but you couldn't have, I don't know, contacted a lawyer, contacted the town or the state and said, hey, since it's legal now, I would like to do this. What do you think? Because to open up a dispensary, you need all these crazy permits and everything. I would assume the same thing exists for, for doing it on a mobile scale. And if you're going to sell it out of your van, don't have a big weed symbol on your van. I don't condone this, but why is everyone so... This is like a perfect example. My niece, when she was younger, she would, uh, you know, stay with us. And in the morning, I would make myself toast or whatnot. I'd open up the trash and I'd see right on the tr top, it would be wrappers for devil dogs. So I'd know my niece was eating devil dogs for breakfast in the morning. I would ask her, what are you doing? Or what did you eat? And she'd be like, oh, you know, toast or something. I'd be like, did you eat devil dogs? No. I'd be like, Madison, you, you put the wrappers on top of the trash. If you're going to do this, put it underneath something so I don't see the wrappers on top of the trash. Why can't you people be inconspicuous if you're going to do illegal activities? Don't put a big weed side on your van when you're selling weed illegally. Don't drink in a locker room and film it and post it places if you're doing it illegally. Like, okay. what is wrong with people today that you can't be? You gotta post everything. It just goes to show how how much people how easily people succumb to everybody's just gotten that. dumber yeah, everybody's gotten More dumber fame that's there's getting fame and then there's just being stupid and what do you think you're gonna do if you have a big weed sign on your van and parking in the walmart parking lot 24 hours sell and people are coming to the van it's like hello just say hey cops come here first i don't get it i don't know oh, i weep for humanity bud as for you as Dory would say, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. Well, that's all we have for this week's edition of Coffee Milk. I'm Mark Laporte. I'm Mitch DiPaolo. Have a great week.